Um, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, as Mary said, this will be the first in a series of six. Um, this first one is going to just kind of cover the basics of audio recording. The remaining five will cover a specific um, digital audio workstation, so a recording software. Um, so it would be great to see all of you um, for the next five, but if there's a specific one that you're interested in, um, I'll kind of go over in this presentation here, just a general brief overview of those five software we'll cover. So you can kind of pick and choose which one might sound more interesting, um, or if you would like to join for all five. Um, if you join for the fundamentals of music theory, those were all sort of connected through all four of them. This one won't really be the same way. Um, some of the aspects and the fundamentals that we cover in this workshop will be referenced in the future. So saying like, oh, remember when we talked about this part of recording? Here's how you do it in Pro Tools. Here's how you do it in FL Studio. So the benefit to coming to this one is that you will get those fundamentals. Um, so you won't kind of just be like, well, I don't even know what that means to even know how to use this. Um, so that's kind of what this one will cover here. So this one kind of connects to the other five, but the other five don't connect to each other. Um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share for the presentation tonight. Um, and yes, yeah, as, as we go, feel free to ask questions. Um, Mary will kind of be like moderating and checking the chat. Um, if you want to, if you don't want to like speak out loud and put questions in the chat, when I'm going through it, most times I will not see those myself until very later. So um, if there's like a pause in my speaking and you do want to speak and ask a question, um, I'm okay with that because you'll usually get a faster answer. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing. All right. Um, and everyone can see my screen, the presentation. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so this will be the fundamentals of digital audio recording, number one. Okay, so here are the sort of four things that we'll cover in this workshop tonight. So we'll cover getting started. So the type of equipment that you may want or need to be able to record at home or elsewhere, um, some definitions of things you may have heard of and not really sure what they mean or what they mean in certain contexts. Talk about different microphones, um, pickup patterns, then we'll talk about recording. So in general, how do you record? What does that process look like? Um, and then we'll talk about editing. So what is that process after you record? And then I'll give you an overview of the software that will be covered in the next five workshops. So first with getting started. So what does digital audio mean? So when you were recording something uh, like, so before you would record things to like tape um, or some other medium like that. When we talk about digital audio, you're not going to be recording to like a CD or to um, like a cassette tape or um, a vinyl record, anything like that. It all stays digital. That, does, that doesn't mean that you can't um, put it on a CD or put it on, you know, some other kind of physical media. But when we're recording digitally, that's, it, it kind of stays in this uh, virtual, um, like stays on your computer or your other device that you're recording on. So without getting too much into the like heady technical aspects of how computers work and how computer software works, um, your voice comes in as an analog signal. Um, so that's sort of like live signal things you can hear, tapping, nails clacking, that's that analog signal. Um, and that gets converted into a digital signal. So like ones and zeros. And that's a process of me sort of speaking uh, like into a microphone, it goes through the computer, through the cable. And then when I hear it back, the reverse is happening. So then that digital signal is being converted back into an analog through the speakers for me to hear it. Um, so that's the difference between before when you would record and it would record it to like to tape and then that tape would then get replicated, so then played back, and then that tape is recorded, and a very complicated process that was not perfect. Um, so digital audio was much more accessible um, and much easier to do. So first thing we'll talk about sort of these like definitions and things that you'll see um, in pretty much every digital audio workstation, which is the name for the recording software. Um, they're also called DAWs, D-A-W. 
Um, so something you'll see is samples and bid def. So this screenshot here is um, the first thing that will pop up when you go into the program Pro Tools. And it'll ask you right away what you want to call it, where you want to save it, if you want to use a template, um, but also your bit depth and your sample rate. Um, if you're going to do um, like for like what they call CD quality, which is like audio, um, any kind of like music, podcasting, anything like that, the sampling rate you're going to want to use is 44,100 samples or 44.1 kilohertz. And the bit depth you want to use is 16 bit. Um, Pro Tools will default to 24 bit. Um, and we'll kind of get into which one you want to choose. But 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bit is sort of like the basic bare minimum, the standard for CD quality. Um, if you did join for the fundamentals of music theory or if you're just kind of familiar, um, with this concept, what samples are is um, frequencies. So kilohertz, um, hertz are the, um, is the, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, when we talk about frequencies, we talk about cycles per second. So like our sound waves, what we're hearing when we're speaking, like human speech, will fall in a certain frequency range. That frequency range, it's sort of like, when you talk about like volume and say like decibels, um, voltage, the, um, can I think of the word this is called? It's sort of like a uh, format of like measuring it is in Hertz. And then kilohertz is obviously in the thousands. So 44.1 kilohertz is the same thing as 44,100 samples. Um, so if you were going to do something that was, say you were creating like an audio track or like for like a music video and you wanted to put that audio with like a DVD or Blu-ray, then you may want to do something a little bit higher, maybe like 40, um, like 48,000. Um, but if you're just doing something for your like music or podcasting, 44.1 should be fine. Um, for your bit depth, if you were going to do DVDs or Blu-rays, you would want to use 24 bit. You would want to use something a little bit higher. Um, bit depth basically affects the signal to noise ratio, which we're going to talk about on the next couple of slides. Um, but basically, the more bit depth you have, um, the less you get, you'll get uh, like audible noise in your recording. So if you're, so the room I'm in right now, I'm here at Creative Experience at Bar. This room has sound treatment. So you're not hearing any kind of outside sounds. If there are library patrons out there using the room or talking, deliveries come through the door, you're not going to hear that noise, any background noise, any hum from the refrigerator, anything like that. But when you're recording at home, most people will not have something where they can sort of record privately um, and record with like sound treatment. You might be recording in your bedroom, you might be recording the kitchen, the living room, the basement. So you are gonna get a lot of noise. Um, and anytime you record in a place that is noisy, you will be recording that noise as well. So that's the importance of having a higher bit depth is you kind of get away from here's where I'm directly talking into the mics. This is the loudest signal versus the noise, which should in theory be a quieter signal. Your bit depth gives you more room uh, to amplify this sound of me talking into the mic without having to amplify that noise. And also for the noise of your computer, because machines also make noise, they hum. Um, you've got like kind of things working. Maybe you're working with a laptop. I know I've like I've had old laptops that kind of like whir and kind of make like fan sounds while they're going. Um, your your mic can pick up those sounds as well. So what I was just kind of talking about with is a signal to noise ratio. So the signal in this term here, signal means basically what you intend to record. So if I'm singing or if I'm doing a podcast, my voice is what I'm intending to record. That's our signal. The noise is everything else going around. That's the sound that just the mic kind of makes as I'm talking into it and it's picking me up. That's the sound of my equipment. Again, if I'm recording at home, that's the dog. <laughs> it's any kind of background noise. Um, is what we talk about when we talk about the signal to noise ratio. Um, and so you can see in this graphic here, on the side here, we have our bit depth. And then over here, we have our sample rate. 
So if you were at 44k um, or 44 kilohertz with a 16 bit, you'll see that you will get, you know, kind of like not a horrible sound. And depending on who your listeners are, they really might not even notice. But as you increase your sample rate and you increase your bit depth, you, you get a lot better resolution. You kind of get this sort of clear signal. Um, now, if you're going to be uploading your music or podcast to um, a site like SoundCloud, some of those will accept 24-bit. But because 16-bit, 44.1 is the um, like sort of standard, um, what I would recommend is to record in a higher, um, like you could even record it, 96K 24-bit, um, which wouldn't really necessarily, you wouldn't really need to do that, but you could record at that higher rate and then still export. So save it to upload it at this uh, sort of like smaller sample rate and smaller bit depth. When you record at that, like um, when you record at a higher bit depth, like I said, you're giving yourself more room between your actual signal, what you're intending to record and what else is getting picked up. Um, it basically increases your noise floor. So your noise floor is if you think of like the, like just like in a house. So like your floor kind of where the bottom of it, that's where your noise floor is, where all that noise is. The closer your noise floor gets to your signal. So the, the louder that background noise is and that noisiness that you're picking up is to your signal, the more that's gonna be hard to even hear you. So if you think of like being on like a phone and you're in like a shopping mall and the person on the other end is like, I can't even hear you. There's so much noise or so much happening. The same thing can happen when you're recording. Um, just, you know, your microphone itself is not going to be able to say, oh, you're singing. So, you know, we're going to cut out all that background noise. It's going to pick that up. So there's a lot you can do as far as just sound treatment, but also just giving yourself this room in your recording. Um, to be able to sort of like isolate and to be able to edit and amplify your signal versus the rest of the, um, the noise that's going on. There are a lot of audiophiles and people who, uh, yeah, just they, they kind of really get into this like critical listening aspect of it. And they'll swear that, you know, all music has to be listened to at like this level, all music has to be recorded at this. If you're listening to it, you know, on like, your cell phone or something like that, your cell phone, it, it doesn't matter what that was recorded at, it's not going to output that. It's just not capable of that. So you also have to think about your listeners. It might sound great to you at home in your like studio, you know, in your great headphones, your great speakers, and you're like, oh, this is fantastic. And you get in your car and you're like, oh no, never mind. <laughs> this does not sound as good as it did on my high quality um, kind of machine um, and my high quality equipment. So that's something to keep in mind, um, especially because when you see something that says high resolution, this takes up more space on your computer. So if you have finite space, and again, your consumers may not even be able to tell the difference between 24-bit to 16-bit, you're going to have to kind of weigh what would be uh, the, the most convenient, or not the most convenient, but uh, the most accessible for you. So if you have a computer that has very like little space or you don't have a flash drive, maybe your flash drive is like 500 megabytes, this can take up quite a bit of space on your drive. Um, so, uh, but but 24 bit, I do recommend recording that because it just, it gives you a lot more dynamic range. And that dynamic range is how loud and soft you can be um, uh, without like clipping or without distortion. And again, without picking up all that noise. I know that this can be kind of a confusing topic, especially just to cover within one hour. Um, so the biggest takeaway from here would be that I recommend recording at probably about here, this like 44 kilohertz, 24 bit. Um, and again, like in every software is going to at some point ask you or have a default of what they recommend recording at. So for Pro Tools, especially if you record here, we already have it set up for 44.1, 24 bit. Um, you can record at 16-bit. Again, if you're recording at home, 16-bit is going to take up less space on your computer. It's going to be a smaller file than something that's 24-bit. Um, if you're going to be making music that's going to be added to um, like a DVD, Blu-ray, something like that, music videos, um, a score for maybe like a film you're working on, 
then you will need to um, have a higher sample rate and have a higher bit depth because that is what is that standard quality for those mediums. But for our purposes and what we're talking about, about just recording a podcast or your music, your song, your album, 24, 44.1 is usually perfectly fine. So let's now get into talking about equipment. So MIDI. Um, so MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, you will never hear anyone call it that. <laughs> we're just going to call it MIDI. Um, there are lots of people who use this and don't even know what it stands for. But in case you were curious, that's what it means. Um, and <clears throat> what it is essentially, and I have one over here. So if you can see here, it's a very, very tiny portable one. Um, but this is a MIDI keyboard, one of the ones that we have here at the library. And again, I'm over here at BAR, um, but Central also has them already on the pods over there, the computers, and as well in the recording room. What a MIDI controller allows you to do is to play any instrument. You would just need to be in a DAW or digital audio workstation that can process MIDI. And at the end of the, um, when I'm going through all the different software, I'll let you know, this one can do MIDI, this one can't. Some of them can't. Some of them are like, you're recording live audio or that's it. Um, but most of them are going to have some kind of MIDI capability. It's set up like a piano. It is not a piano. Um, it's set up like this because this is honestly the easiest way to view playing music. You can look and say, okay, um, you know, I know what this note is versus this note. And it's also more portable. It's flat and you can see how tiny, super lightweight this can fit in the backpack, computer bag, very tiny. They do make bigger ones. They make ones that are 88 keys, like a full size keyboard or um, piano. They make ones that are two octaves, three octaves, four octaves. Um, it's all about kind of what you need and how, and kind of your space. So if you've, you know, a studio apartment, but you still wanna be able to make music and you're like, I don't have the room for a huge MIDI controller, this will get the job done, I promise. Um, uh, yeah, so it's set up as like a keyboard and the sort of like design, just because that is the simplest for playing. If you were, you know, they made like a MIDI guitar, that would be like impossible. There would be such a learning curve to something that complex um, where you're like, oh, this is an E, but also way down here is an E, but it's different than this E. This is much clearer where you're like, this note is lower than the same note over here. Um, and you also have like controls here and I'm sure I'm on a web camera, I'm sure it's not very clear, but you can change the octave. Um, so you're not just stuck, you know, with like middle C, you know, you can make it um, like a bassier, you can make it lighter. So if you're, if you wanted to emulate a bass guitar, you could put it a couple octaves down and kind of get it in that bass guitar range. If you wanted to mimic, um, I played stuff and make, make it sound like a xylophone. And so I just real high octave and then it is very tinny and bright and light. Um, you will need a, like a, a virtual instrument that's compatible with it. So like when we look at our software like FL Studio, they have what's called packs and all those packs have different instruments. So they'll have one that says kick drum. And so now I can pull the kick drum into that software and I can hit these pads here. And these pads will now sound like a kick drum. And I can say, okay, well, you know what? I actually, now I need um, a snare. So I can pull the snare over another part of the drum set and I can hit it and now it sounds like a snare. I can pull the next one over. Okay, you know, now this sounds like, I can make it sound like a piano if I would like to. Um, but the takeaway is that this doesn't make any audio itself. It's all virtual. So I can press these keys all I want. I can even have this plugged in and press it. It will not do anything unless I'm in a software that can process MIDI and I have virtual instruments that I can use. Most of the DAWs, especially the ones that we'll look at, when you buy just the base version of them, they will have um, virtual instruments in there that you can use. And you can also buy virtual instruments. Um, like I know like Studio One will sell packs like okay, I want a pack that has a bunch of sounds for um, Afro-Caribbean music. I want to really make something that sounds like a salsa song or um, reggaeton or something like that. You can buy a pack and it'll have clave, it'll have you know maracas, it'll have all kinds of sounds that maybe won't come with the bass package, which is going to be like drums, piano, uh, an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar, bass guitar. Um, and they even make ones that will emulate specific instruments. 
So it'll be like, oh, this is, you know, a uh, Les Paul 1961, and it's emulating that sound. Um, so it, it's, it's really great for, uh, depending on the brand you buy, pretty low price to sort of get limitless instruments. Um, if you are using it as a guitar, um, the one thing that you will want to keep in mind is you will not get that downstrum upstrum sound from just like a regular like guitar sound. So you will just get that single strum pattern or strum sound. Um, so for certain instruments, it's not going to really sound as natural, but obviously a piano, this is perfectly fine. Again, drums, things like that. But for guitar, where you want to have that like strum up and down, which will sound different when you're doing that in person, you won't get exactly that from here. Um, but depending on the song that you're making, if that guitar is just kind of adding to your song, it's just another element in the background, or if you don't mind that it's just going to have that downstrum sound, then you'll be totally fine. Um, but just something to keep in mind, depending on what instrument that you want to kind of make it work with. Um, Any questions on MIDI or how that works? Anything? Okay. So next we're gonna talk about digital audio recording equipment. So these are just suggestions. Um, as always, we're back open with pretty much full services um, beyond just like kind of like a few little things and still keeping our a lot of our COVID precautions as far as like cleaning procedures, social distancing, um, but the library is back open. So. If you kind of learn what you want to learn from these workshops and then come in here and do all your recording, you are more than welcome. We'd be happy to see you. But if you want to be able to record at home, this is some suggested equipment. Price range for these things will totally vary depending on brand, whether you buy new or used. Um, again, with like the MIDI keyboard, something that's an 88 key with like full size keys versus this one, which you can tell has very pretty small keys and it's very compact. Um, this in no way, someone would be like, that's piano shape, but no one's going to confuse this for being a piano the way something bigger would be. Um, this is going to cost a lot less than the huge one. Um, and, and again, brand will make a difference. So if you get some like off brand that no one's ever heard of MIDI keyboard, it might cost you 50 bucks. Um, you get kind of a big name like Imadio or something like that. It might kind of get in the hundred dollar range. It will, it'll definitely vary. Um, you will get a lot of resellers, um, lots of different sites, Amazon, Sweetwater, that will have them. Um, but yeah, price range for all of these will really range. Um, but here's some suggested things. So um, it's, it's digital, so you need some type of computer. Um, the good news is that you can really kind of do it on any kind of device. Um, your, your mileage will vary. <laughs> so if you are gonna do it on a phone, a phone is going to be much easier for you to make like your instrumentals that you're going to sing along to or something um, than it will be if you were doing it on like a like laptop or desktop computer. Um, just because you will not have the ability to hook up things like microphones unless they're made for it. So they do make microphones and I've like seen them in like, you know, videos or whatever where someone's like plugged straight into their like headphone jack or something and they got like a little tiny microphone that'll work it's not going to be the best quality right because it's plugging directly into your cell phone um it's not going to be the same as something like the equipment that we have in here but if you're just trying to get started and maybe you can kind of like use that sort of low quality sound or lower resolution sound as part of like a creative thing it's very common in music for people to intentionally make their music kind of muddy and dark so you can use that to your benefit. Um, same thing with like using like a tablet. If you have any kind of Apple product, you will have GarageBand for free. So whether that's a Mac or a, an iPad or an iPhone, it comes with it. And it's pretty good. I've used it on the phone. Um, it's like, it's not the best because your phone's not very big. It's a lot easier on the tablet, but it is totally possible. Um, as far as with like, um, like Amazon Fire, things like that. I don't think that would work. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know of any like software that you could get on those. Um, the way that like the iPads and stuff already come with it on there. That'd be something that, you know, we could look into if you wanted, you know, some help and be like, oh, will this work? Will this not work? Um, but I know for sure that Apple products already have that built in. Um, I do recommend 
just general for recording versus just like making your instrumental to do it on a computer again coming here or if you have one at home um laptops laptops can be kind of hard um because if they don't have like a powerful processor you usually need at least eight gigs of ram and that's like at least you usually want more than that um and you do want something more up to date and newer because your computer is going to be processing a lot um again what i was saying before about like you know what you record at 24 bit you know that can take up a lot of space that also requires a lot for to record at so if you have a computer that you're like this barely works like microsoft word it's it probably will not work um to record audio on um it might work to just like record your vocals to it or record a guitar to it or something like that it would probably be pretty hard for you to get um sort of just like a, a good workflow doing any kind of like midi or virtual instrumentation um because that that takes a lot of process um uh midi files especially they take up a lot of space what i actually usually do is i'll record um like a midi track and then i'll export it as a wave and then just bring it back in because it actually can like take up like half the space <laughs> that it will um if i would leave it as a midi um file or an instrument file um desktops are obviously going to be a lot better um because you know when you have that like, computer tower that's a whole processor there all in ones will kind of give you it'll really depend. So we have all ones here at the library and they're great, people record to them. I've recorded to them for like library purposes, making instrumentals, recording vocals on them and they're great. Um, it definitely works. Um, but again, it's gonna depend on the computer that you're using, how, how well it does. Um, a Chromebook, totally possible to record to. Um, I've done it, it's, yeah, like I said, it, it'll, it depends on your quality of your machine. So the thing about Chromebooks is that you cannot connect a uh, audio interface to them. Um, you can't install drivers. So that's the reason why you can't connect an audio interface. And the interface, I meant to bring one today to be able to hold up and show you. Um, and the, the camera won't quite work to be able to show you the one that we have in here. But your audio interface is where you connect your mics to, you connect your instruments to, your headphones, your studio monitors to then connect to your computer. It's sort of that, uh, sort of like mid, like little union station for all of your audio equipment to connect to your computer. Um, those require drivers to be installed for them to work and usually a CD or a download. You can't download something like that on a Chromebook. They're pretty much just web-based. So you'll have to use just web-based software. But the good news is there are web-based software. Um, FL Studio actually makes a mobile version that you can get on a Chromebook. Um, they also have things like BandLab and I'll talk more about these in the sort of the last section where we talked just about all the different DAWs, it is definitely possible to record on a Chromebook. The Chromebook is going to have way more issues lagging than other um, than other computers are. Um, when I've recorded to them, sometimes the lagging is so bad. And by lagging, I mean, I'm singing and then I'm hearing it like two seconds later. And it's not huge, but if you've ever had that issue, like maybe like, you're talking on the phone and then someone who you're talking to the phone on comes into the room and now you can hear yourself but not at the same time as you're speaking and it kind of makes your brain crazy you're like what am i hearing it's really distracting um that is the issue that i've had a lot in chromebooks it uh, processes um oh was there a question yeah on it we received a request if you could just slow down a little bit with some of the topics oh sure um so yeah, so with the, the Chromebook, it does work for the MIDI keyboard just fine. MIDI keyboards typically do not require um, a driver, which is like, a, again, that downloaded like software for just sync to the computer. Um, I haven't had, I've, I've had several MIDI keyboards and I've never had that issue. Um, typically they're plug and play, which means that they're USB. So you plug one end into the MIDI keyboard, you plug the other end into the computer and that's really all you need. Um, but it is a lot harder to record sort of like live vocals the way that you could on like a um, regular laptop or on a desktop computer. So you do have multiple options, um, but like I said, your mileage will vary between the different types of machines. Um, so the next thing with the audio interface is what I was saying, it's where you connect your mics, um, your guitars, if you have acoustic electric or you have a regular electric guitar, bass guitar, um, any kind of equipment like that. 
you could plug into your audio interface. Um, you don't need one to record. Um, there. Uh... And we did get a question. Okay. Is an audio interface different from a regular docking station? Do your instruments or MIDI plug into the audio interface and then the audio in interface plugs into the computer? Yes, so the audio interface, and let me let me see if I can just kind of move this. Uh, and I can't, I, just, I don't think I can see. Oh, I can't see my video. Okay, so, sorry, it's so weird doing it and then trying to look at the camera at the same time. Okay, so this machine here is an audio interface. So this one has uh, several inputs. So I'll unplug with these microphones that we're not using here so you can see. So uh, let me make sure it gets the light. Okay, so if you're seeing these sort of like circular inputs here, that outside circular piece is where this cable plugs into. Uh, and this is a uh, microphone cable. So this would connect to any microphone that's not USB. It's going to connect to an XLR, which is the name of this cable. Um, XLR will always have either that kind of, this is the part that goes into your, um, interface, the other end will basically not have the plugs and it'll plug directly into your microphone. And your microphone will have a piece on the bottom that looks like this with the little prong sticking out. Um, so that sticks into this part here. If you see this little inside circle kind of like weird piece, that is where an instrument cable will go. And I meant to bring an instrument cable and I forgot I only brought an XLR, um, but an instrument cable, um, kind of looks like, uh, it, it'll look very similar to an end just like this. It'll actually look almost exactly like this kind of end. I just pulled up the headphones. It'll look like this. So it'll have a tip and then a ring and then a sleeve here. So it'll, it'll have this kind of setup and that would plug right into here. And I, I was able to plug it in there. That wouldn't work, these are headphones. <laughs> uh, but that's exactly how you would plug it in like a, in a guitar or something like that. This is a very specific piece of um, like equipment for audio recording. And I, I recommend it for really your best, your best recording, especially if you're recording music. If you're recording podcasting or you are recording where you're kind of just recording your voice over maybe an instrumental, maybe it's one's already made for you or something like that, then you should be fine with the USB mic. Um, I, I don't care for USB mics as much as I do the XLR ones because the sound levels, basically when I was talking about like, oh, your voice goes from analog to the digital and the digital back to analog, the USB cable does it at a much slower rate than the than that XLR cable does. So it's it's much slower, which means you get a lot more lagging. USB mic is the only kind of mic you can use with a Chromebook. Um, and so the, I, in my experience, that's kind of why it's a little bit, um, you, you do get a lot of more lagging when you use those types of machines. Um, but this also has uh, over here, the, um, the sound. So this is for like my headphones to adjust those levels and then to adjust for my studio monitors, which are, if you see that yellow speaker here in the corner, those are studio monitors. Monitors is when you refer to like speakers, like audio speakers are called monitors. And this is right here. These are, the brand is KRK. Um, and we have two of them. So those connect into the back of this machine and then your headphones um, connect to the front, your microphones to the front, as well as if you are plugging any instruments in. And then you also have uh, gain controls here as well for each microphone. And Jen, I'll talk about gain in a second. So you have a lot more controls um, and it's a lot more like precise for recording and connecting your equipment. Sorry about that. Okay. So that kind of makes more sense about what you would use an audio interface for. Um, I still have a question about, so the audio interface, all your instruments go into it, you have speakers coming off of it, but how does it connect to your computer? USB. Okay, yeah, yep. so like a regular, ordinary USB port. And it'll have a very specific end that goes into the interface, but the part that goes into your computer is USB. Yep. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Um, and you might be familiar with like, um, like using just like regular computer speakers and those plug-in use just like USB or something like that. These ones are just more high quality. So they're meant to um, be able to like reproduce much high quality, high quality audio. Um, you could just use the speakers that come with your phone or I'm sorry, well, yes, your phone, if you were using that, but also with your, um, like if I record on my laptop, I don't have a big setup. I'm not gonna do all that. I will use an interface but I'll listen back just through the speakers on my computer or my headphones. Um, so you you would need to have all of these things plugged in, um, but the the benefit of the um, the interface is it's really the only way that you can connect a USB mic. Not all mics will have a USB option. Um, so if you wanna use an XLR um, mic, which is those like silver and black cables I was showing you, if you want to be able to use one of those, you have to have an interface. There's no other way to connect that to your computer. Um, so if you, yeah, so if, if you want to use, if you're like, oh, I've heard this mic is great and it only comes in XLR, you have to have a, an interface. That's the only way to use it. Um, most manufacturers, just in general of microphones, like all the different brands like Newman, Shure, um, uh, Sennheiser, all of those, they'll have sort of like a USB option because they want to have like a budget friendly option um, or something like that, but the like the more high quality microphones and the ones that they advertise as being their best quality, their best foot forward are going to be XLR mics. And uh, in both the recording rooms at Central and at Bar, um, in the recording rooms we are using uh, XLR microphones. At Central we have the USB versions of the Yetis and we have the XLR versions of the Yetis. Um, on the pause and then in the recording room. So you can kind of use both. Um, as far as microphones, we've already kind of talked about USB versus XLR. Um, and and another, in the next slide, I'll talk about the difference between the different types of microphones and where you might use one versus the other. Um, but you'll need a microphone. Um, your computer will have like a built-in. Um, oh, is there a question? Anna, could you elaborate no. on some specifics for like if they're doing audio production versus podcasting or recording a song? Um, for uh, which type of equipment? Can you a little bit of everything? Okay. Um, so yeah, so when you're when you're doing just podcasting, it definitely gives you a lot more freedom um, because you just need to be able to record your voice. Um, can that like, Go ahead. Oh, no, no, go right ahead. Um, I wanted to ask a dumb question. If you wanted to, to record something from an old tape, you know, like a, an, a regular um, reel-to-reel -reel tape, mm -hmm. can, you do the, can you do that on an XLR cable? So an XLR cable, another name for it is a microphone cable. So it just connects like a microphone to like an interface or or something like that, something where it can receive that um, that uh, signal. If you were going to try to record something from a reel-to-reel -reel tape, they do make like reel-to-reel -reel tape to you know digital converters, and I would recommend using something like that. Um, if you do have something where you can play that back just out loud, you could mic it. But um, kind of what I was saying on the other slides, when you do that, you're going to pick up any kind of sound, and you might want that. You might want that sort of like warm tape sound as it's like playing back and that would be okay um but you will get well, the sound was, like, oh go ahead yeah that was that was what i was wondering if it was um if like if i came in with to the the recording room at central and tried to do it with an xlr cable the mic and played it on my tape player would that could i get the volume up high enough um so do you know what i'm trying to ask yeah, for sure. So if you were to move the microphone closer to the sound, like the output source, wherever the speaker or whatever it is on your um, like cassette player, it'll pick it up be because these mics are directional. So it's going to pick it up right where you're pointing it and it'll pick it up just fine. You'll just have to know that it's going to pick up the sound of the machine as well. But if that doesn't bother you, then yeah, I would go for it. It would totally work. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And we um, can come into Central. Do we need to make a reservation to come in and use the recording room? Um, you don't need to make a reservation. We do recommend it just to make sure that one, you get the exact time you want. So if you have like a work schedule where you're like, you know, I have to get in like after five or something like that. And you want to guarantee that you have a time, especially in summer where we have a lot of kids coming in. Um, we would recommend it, but you can also walk into the room. So if you happen to be at Central picking up your materials, um, like books or DVDs, and you want to check to see if the recording room is free, and it is, you are more than welcome to just jump in and use it. Awesome. Can you tell me where it's located? Is it on the first floor or the second floor? Um, for both bar and for Central, we're located on the first floor. And Central, it's a little trickier to find because it's sort of in the back. Um, but if you come in um, on the side where it's Locust Street, you'll be automatically on the first floor and you'll just walk straight back. And if you just keep walking back, you will eventually walk into our room. Um, if you come oh, okay. in. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, now go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's where you have all the, where you can rent or uh, check out the, the DVDs and all the music players and stuff way back in that room. Yes, we're actually right um, next to that room. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, oh, so podcasting versus like recording music. So yes, when you record for podcasting, um, it's a little bit simpler because you're just going to be recording your voice, right? So you don't have these kind of extra elements that we might talk about today about, you know, balancing a recording and, you know, different, your guitar and your drums and all of that, or even with like the MIDI recording that like music. So you definitely get a lot more freedom. Um, if you, you know, if all you have is like a tablet or something and you wanted to get that mic that plugs just right into it and use it, that would probably be good enough quality for a podcast. Um, the, the danger of doing that for music is, like I said, it's going to be noisier. It's going to be a muddier recording because that's a lower quality microphone. Um, so for, as far as what machine you would want to use for podcasting, um, you do get a, a little bit more freedom that way. Um, but your your quality of microphones that you can use to pick up will vary between being able to use a Chromebook or being able to use your phone. The USB Yetis do work on the Chromebook, no problem as far as connectivity. It's just that lagging. Um, if the the lagging is going to come up when you are, we have your headphones on and you're hearing yourself back to kind of get your levels and to make sure that you're speaking clearly and it's recording you the whole time you're like oh I don't hear myself anymore or something must have happened if you didn't have your headphones on and you were just speaking into the microphone and then you were to process that audio and kind of edit it later then lagging is a step you would bypass that's not something you want to do when you're recording music because you want to be on time and you want to be on beat and you want to be in key so you need to be able to hear that audio track um, in the background that instrumental track so you'll need your headphones on but you will you'll have that lagging issue more often than not so if you're recording a podcast and you have a Chromebook and you want to get this USB mic, I think it's like maybe they, they make them probably between 50 and 100 bucks for a USB mic, um, you'd be ready to go. You would just kind of want to know that, oh, okay, I might have lagging, so maybe I can't hear myself while I'm recording. You still will be able to see your levels on the computer and the software. And that's something we'll talk about when we go through the different software. Like, okay, here's how you check your levels just visually. Even if you're like, well, I don't think I'm that loud, and the meter's telling you, no, you're very loud, <laughs> you'll be able to see that difference. <laughs> um, so that's that's kind of like the benefit of being able to see the meter. I talk really loud. I know I talk really loud. I know I project. It's my whole family. We all talk that way. So sometimes when I record like an interview or something, I'm like, I might need to be a little bit quieter. I might need to turn myself down a little bit. Um, you'll hear that much better and maybe be able to tell better in your headphones. Um, but yeah, if you're just recording like a podcast or an interview, it's you and a guest and you're both sitting at the microphone and talking and you're like, oh, this lagging is going to bother us. You should be fine to record without hearing yourself. I just would not recommend doing that when you're recording music, because again, you're going to want to be able to hear the music as you're doing it. Maybe if you're doing like it's me and my guitar and I'm playing, well, I can hear my guitar because I'm playing it right now. Then again, you should probably be okay. Um, you just run that risk of like, oh man, I was quieter or, you know, I accidentally bumped the table and the mic moved and now, you know, it didn't pick me up the way that I thought it would. And you would have heard that in the headphones, but it's totally doable and totally possible. 
Um, if you're going to be doing something that has a lot of processing, so you're doing MIDI, you're doing you know synthesizer. So again, that kind of like virtual instrument type of thing. And maybe you're also gonna have a guitar plugged in. And you've got this whole setup. You probably are gonna want a desktop computer um, just because it's gonna process a lot better. Um, gaming laptops, if you're like, I don't have the space for that. Um, gaming laptops, um, because they're meant to process really like, um, uh, like really powerful video games that take up a lot of space, like Minecraft or like World of Warcraft or, you know, all those types of games. So a lot of audio, um, like engineers and producers, they'll buy gaming laptops, like Alienware or something like that, because if it can process that, it can totally handle Pro Tools and your instruments and things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on exactly what your setup is going to be. A lot of people set up, especially when they get started, are really simple. It's going to be you and an instrumental that you may or may not make yourself. You could totally just have a very simple setup, your Chromebook or your laptop or your phone, you know, and just one simple USB microphone. But once you get more into it, especially once you kind of develop that critical ear and being able to hear the differences in quality, then it might benefit to, uh, to be able to have higher quality equipment. And to do that, you'll need a higher quality computer. Or you can just come here where we already have it for you. <laughs> um, and with audio interfaces, uh, there are a wide variety of them. Um, again, it's going to depend on what your setup is. So you can get ones that have just one input, where it's just you can plug a mic in and then maybe plug an instrument in. Um, or you can plug in four, or you can plug in 16, or you can have a whole channel rack. Um, it's going to depend on what you're doing. If you know that it's only ever going to be maybe you and the guitar, maybe you only need one that has two inputs. Um, if you know that like it may be you and four friends doing a podcast and you all want your individual microphones and you know maybe you're going to record a band, you're going to need individual inputs for all of those microphones or all those instruments. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, the smaller and less inputs, the cheaper the price, obviously the more inputs um, it's going to cost more. Um, the good thing about an audio interface is that most audio interfaces are going to have a built-in preamp, which means you can use any microphone because it's automatically going to bring the microphone level to line level, which is what you need to record. Um, so the audio interface kind of does that for you. You can buy external preamps, which will kind of, it's another, another stage of amplifying your signal. It's not usually necessary when you're doing sort of simpler recordings, again, you and the guitar or just your voice or just podcasting. Um, and it'll depend on your microphone. So we have like pretty quiet microphones here um, at bar. Um, so they do need a little bit more um, like gain on our interface. At Central, those microphones over there, they don't really need it because they have gain right on the microphone itself. So those are kind of like factors you want to think like, okay, do I want to have to get this and this and this? Well, maybe I'll get a microphone that'll kind of already do this. Maybe I'll get an interface that already does this process for me. Um, and as far as cables, if you are going to connect studio monitors to whether it's your laptop or your uh, desktop computer, and you're going to connect them to the interface, you will need speaker cables. Speaker cables will look a lot like the XLR cables, um, and they will be designated. Like if you go to Guitar Center, they'll be able to be like, oh, those are what those are used for. Um, you'll need an XLR for your mics. Um, you'll need an instrument cable for your instruments. Um, and those are only going to be instruments that will be plugging in. So your acoustic guitar does not need an instrument cable. Your acoustic electric, yes. Your electric guitar, yes. Your bass guitar, yes. Uh, your electric violin, yes. Your guitar, yes. <laughs> we'll kind of need all of those things. So depending on what you're recording. Um, another thing that I did not put on here, but it's really important. Um, and let me actually change my camera to show you guys over here if I can do that. Okay, so here I have like a couple different um, instruments if you're looking, or not instruments, but different pieces of equipment. Um, so this here is again the XLR. So you have the tip that's going to have the like prongs and then just the flat one where these would you know plug into each other you see like that um it sounds very juvenile but they are usually referred to as male and female so you can get ones that are um male to male like maybe if you're it just would depend on what you're connecting it to 
you can get male to male, you can get female to female, you can get female to male. Um, but yes, as juvenile as it sounds, that is actually how they will a lot of times be labeled. Um, the, what we have here is a male to female or female to male, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, as you can see here, if I put it lower for a microphone, we have one end of it here plugged into the base of the mic. If I unplug it here, you can see on the back hole, you can see I know it's so dark in here over in this corner, um, but it has these little prongs here that look just like the ones in the cable. So that's how it plugs just right into it. Any mic that is uh, XLR is going to have that. Uh, and then yeah, we have our microphone here. Um, here's like another type of microphone. This is a more like a stage mic or an instrument mic. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this microphone on the next slide. Um, here's a bigger, sort of thicker MIDI keyboard than the one I was showing you before. So those these keys here, you can see are much thicker than this guy here. This guy eats like this guy for breakfast. It's a very, <laughs> very thick one. Um, these keys are more close to a full-size keyboard. Um, so if you're coming off, like you know how to play piano, you'll have an easier time playing something like this where the keys are sort of a standard size rather than the tiny compact one. But even so, this is still pretty lightweight, not exactly backpack size, but maybe, yeah, if you're in a small space to record, um, doesn't take up too, many, too much space. And you also get your octave controls here, drum pads as well. Uh, this is a USB Yeti microphone. This is actually mine from home. Um, and of course I have the blackout version, so it's even harder to tell. Um, but this knob up here, and this is the exact same way they work at Central, this knob here turns up its own gain. So this microphone can get very, very, very loud. Um, it can pick up a lot. Um, if you have like someone who's really quiet or if you're really quiet, um, this is a, a, a good microphone because it has that gain setting. Um, not every mic has this. This is not a super common feature. Um, as you can see on the other two mics that we have over here, neither of them have it. Um, and then this connects just with a regular USB end. Um, and then the last piece of equipment that we'll talk about, and there are so many more that I didn't cover, but these are sort of the basics. Um, here are headphones. These are the headphones that we have here. Um, we also have these at Central. Um, and these are uh, closed back headphones. So there are two types of headphones, closed back and open back. Um, the benefit to having open back headphones is when you're mixing. Um, let me change, sorry. Is when you're mixing because you wanna be able to hear it naturally. When you have a uh, closed back, it's like where they're like if you were to put your hands over your ears. This doesn't sound as natural, right? I sound different. Everything around me sounds different. It's sort of coloring the sound. It makes it sound different. That's perfect for when you're recording because sound's not bleeding in or out. You're kind of just getting stuck in this little world of whatever's coming out of the headphones. But when you're mixing, you want to kind of see how it's going to hear or how it's going to sound in the wild. So you're going to want to have um, open back where sound will kind of bleed in and out because you're no longer recording. If you record, if you're like, well, I'm only going to get the ones, you know, this one or that one. If you record with open back headphones, the problem is when that sound bleeds out, it'll bleed right into your microphone. So you'll end up getting where you're hearing <laughs> what your, what your microphone or what your headphones are outputting, which is your voice and audio track right back into the microphone. And if you're directly at it, when we talk about where it's that noise, that extra, um, like that extra noise happening in the background. So when you go to now amplify your voice over the track, well now you're also amplifying that sound that was escaping your headphones. So you definitely wanna record with closed back headphones um, and mix with open back so that way you get that more natural sound from your headphones. So any questions on those? Well, you were talking about recording onto your laptop. Say I come into the recording room. Do I need to bring my laptop to record a CD no, on it? No? No. Um, you're more than welcome to bring um, your own computer. We do have space if um, you want to bring 
um, your material, we definitely have had people, especially during COVID time, that are like, oh, I want to bring my own microphone or I want to bring my own computer. And that's totally okay. Um, we'll still be here to help you if you have any questions, um, but it's not necessary to bring it. No, um, we have desktop computers. And that's the room I'm in here right now. So we have computers in here. We have all the equipment already in here. Um, as far as like your project with recording from like the reel to reel, we do not have that here in this space. Um, but you'd be more than welcome to use our microphones here in this space, of course. Right. Okay. So I bring in my cassette player, which is a pretty nice stereo cassette player okay. <clears throat> and the tape. So you have an XLR cable and I just need to bring CDs and then use everything else I is there that I would need. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you want to, yeah, if you want to be able to um, sort of like burn that, that sound to a CD, um, you'll definitely want to go to central. Yeah. We don't have any disc drives here at bar. Um, not yet. Um, but at Central, yes, you would definitely be able to record the audio you um, you want from your cassette and then burn it to a CD, definitely. Yeah, that's what I want to do. So it would be better to go to Central and I just would bring my cassette player with the cassette, of course, and then CDs to record on. Yes, yep, that's and, all you would need. We would have everything else for you. And the XLR cable would be the best to use uh, because it, it doesn't lag and... There's not a lot of machine noise on my cassette player because it's do so it it should come out pretty well. In other words, I want the CD to be loud enough that I could put it in my car and play it. Sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like I said, if you record, you know, you wouldn't want to just like start playing it and recording from, you know, recording from it. You'd want to position the microphone where it's facing wherever the speaker is. So like I know in a lot of like ones I've seen before, the speaker's like on top of the machine, sometimes it's on the side. You'd want to place them or position the mic where it's pointing like right at it. So like, again, using this microphone here as an example, here's the uh -huh. microphone. Um, if I'm, this end here is where the, um, uh, where, the, where the mic picks up. So it doesn't pick up from the side, it picks up here from the front. I would want to point, I would want to point the microphone right at where the speakers are of the cassette um, player. And then you will get a, yeah, a perfect volume of, um, of recording. Oh, okay, great. So in other, <clears throat> it's stereo. So it has a speaker on each end. It's, ob it's kind of oval shaped and it has mm -hmm. speakers on each end. So I would want to put the mic right in the center probably of the, the front of the player. And then um, if I turn the vo if I turn the volume all the way up, will that enhance the volume on the CD that I'm burning? Um, I would, yeah. So I would um, your yeah your machine the cassette player that you're playing off of. I would have that at full volume, um, and that that way the the mic is you wouldn't have to like later in the software you know increase the volume. That volume should be more than enough. Um, okay. And then, um, and then for uh, the the mic thing, you shouldn't really need to add any amplitude to the mic itself, um, especially because you'll be recording so close. Um, you don't want to record too close. And whoever's in the room, they can um, kind of help you and be like, okay, here's how you should position it. Because you don't want it too close because then it, it could be too loud. Um, but I would recommend yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was wondering about feedback. If you had it too close, would you get feedback or not? Is, is it, does it adjust for that? Is that what you were telling us? Um, it, it shouldn't give you feedback um, unless, it, yeah, it shouldn't give you feedback unless it's also like in record mode or something like that. You shouldn't get feedback, but what you can get is clipping where it'll sound distorted. Um, so that's the danger oh, of having okay. it too close and too loud. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the MIDI, which you were talking about, if I wanted to record off of a computer or a laptop, um, say there, there's a site called HymnSite that has hymns playing on MIDI, and I wanted to record that on a CD or burn it, is that possible to do in the recording room, room as well? From Well, you have computers in there, so mm -hmm. do you um, know what yeah. I'm asking? So if, if that uh, website has a way for you to download um those um like sounds then yeah you would definitely be able to um burn them to a cd um we, we don't have like a setup for you to be able to record audio that's just playing off the computer you wouldn't want to do that because that is how you'll get feedback oh okay okay i got it mm -hmm. and we did have thank a you question. so much what You're type welcome. of cds do i need to record at central cd rw that means rewritable 
Um, yep, that's what you want. So that way you can burn onto it. Yep, so CDRW. Um, you wanna make sure that you don't get like DVD, like DVD or RW, those are usually right in the same spot. Um, DVD or RW would be if you were doing video. So you definitely just wanna get CDRW. CDRW, that's the one you can record on, right? Yes, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it should say and rewritable on the package. That's what you want. Right, I, I think I got it, okay. Thanks whoever asked that question. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. So, um, and I'm, so we'll move on. If everyone's good here, we'll move on to the next slide where we'll talk about the different types of microphones. And, and if you have any questions that you think of later while we're going, no worries. Feel free to still ask. Um, okay. So, okay. different. Um, oh, go right ahead. Oh, no. The next meeting is next Thursday at 5 30. Um, that one will not be at 5 30. That one will be at 6. Oh, okay. And will they be at six then from then on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one um, is just a lot more information. So we didn't want to have to try to cram it into an hour. And it's looking like we may may not finish anyway, which is okay. Because um, like I said, we have uh, a lot, uh, five more weeks to cover stuff. So, um, but yeah, the other ones will start at six. Okay, great. And will we use the same meeting um, uh, number and passcode or will you send one each week? I will send one each week. Yep, there'll be different um, yep, different meetings. And I'll say in the subject line, just so you can keep track of all of them, I'll say in the subject line, this is for this meeting for this week. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Real you 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 speak clearly, you speak well, and it's very informative. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the types of microphones. Uh, oh, it looks like we have a question. Um, where I stand for the other classes on our website, so slpl.org, um, and on our homepage, you will see where it says virtual events. Um, and when you see that, if you can filter by creative experience, then I'll put that in. I can put it in the chat. Okay, but we're signed up. We don't have to sign up each week, do we? Yes, yes, you do want to sign up each week. Um, that, that's oh, okay. the only way you get on that list to be emailed. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's good because I thought I was signed up for all the rest of them. Okay. No, nope, that's totally okay. Yep, that happens. I think she meant, do you have to every week sign up for the next one? But you can go out there and sign up for all six of the classes at one time. Yes, they, you can. Yep, you just want to make sure you're signed up for all of them. Yep. So if you, don't sign up, you don't have to sign up again, right? Am I yes. correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, okay. So I, but it'll, I'll be able to check that and see, cause I'm not sure if I did sign up for all of them at once or not. Yep. I, and if you accidentally sign up twice, it's okay. We'll be able to remove the second one you signed up if you happen to. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. I love these classes. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Um, so for the different types of microphones, so um, there, are, there are many different types of microphones. These are the three main ones that we'll talk about because they're the main ones that you're going to encounter and probably use. Um, so we have ribbon, dynamic, and condenser. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a ribbon. I didn't bring a ribbon mic for you guys to see, but I do have some pictures here. Um, so a ribbon mic, it's named that because it has a very, very thin, like thinner than a single piece of human hair, very thin metal ribbon that's just floating between two magnets. And when you speak into it, that's what's, uh, as you're speaking into it, it's going to move. And that is how, that's how it picks up your sound. Um, it sounds almost crazy and made up to me, but that's how it works. <laughs> um, the <laughs> ribbon is its diaphragm. So the diaphragm is what moves in reaction to sound speaking into it. So you speak into it, that moves, and it's kind of how your ears work. So if I speak into, or not even to your ear, but if I speak to you, your ears are going to pick up those sound waves and it's sort of sort of replicating it for you to hear it. Well, that's how a microphone works as well. Um, ribbon mics, because of that, you know, thinner than a human hair uh, ribbon that's in there, <laughs> they're really, really delicate. Um, they're not, they're not, you know, super fragile like these days, but definitely like older ones. And like, if you get like a vintage model, they're going to be very, very delicate. Um, 
And they, um, they're really great because since they are so delicate and they are so sensitive, um, something that gets like said about them a lot, which I think is kind of exaggerating, but something to keep in mind, they say that they like pick up the exact same way that your ears do, um, that they're that sensitive. And they do have a really great frequency response. Um, they kind of can pick up the full like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz that human hearing is a, a bit, like able to hear. Um, which is different than a lot of microphones. So ribbons are great for that reason. They're definitely better for a studio microphone versus you taking this one out on the road. Um, you can find ones, especially like newer ones that are made that will say like, oh, this one's great for stage. Um, but typically you would wanna use this one in like a studio recording uh, like setting um, just because they are kind of like fragile, um, kind of like easier to damage. Um, but they do pick up like a really great sound. So they would be great for recording something like um, like a choir, like multiple voices recording um, or a, acoustic guitar, something like that. They would pick up those sounds very naturally. So if you're, if you're someone where when you're singing into the microphone, you kind of want the microphone to make you sound your absolute best. This might not be the microphone because it's not super flattering. It's going to sound exactly how it sounds kind of when it's inputted. But that means that it's great for instruments. So that means that you're playing your guitar and it's going to, how it sounds to you when you're playing it, your microphone's gonna pick it up that same way. Um, so it's a great microphone for instruments. Um, I would find it a little bit too delicate to record like something like drums, which would be very, very loud, um, but really, really great for vocals. Um, the other thing about ribbon mics is that they're usually built to be bi-directional, which means that they pick up in the front and in the back but they don't pick up on the sides. Um, so that's why they like, especially like if you would go back and look at like old episodes of like talk shows um, and probably even still now, the microphone that they use is usually a ribbon mic um, and it's bi-directional. And like I said, it picks up how you sound. So it's really great for an interview. So like if you're thinking podcasting, um, a ribbon mic would be great. You're not gonna be super loud when you're recording, um, just be on like your natural voice. Um, and you'll come through the way that you sound. Um, they're also really great for um, anything where you're worried about proximity effect. So proximity effect happens when you get really, really close to a microphone, you sound bassier. So again, think of when you're on the phone, you know, you're like whispering about something and you get really close, your voice will sound deeper than if you're holding it further away. Um, and if you think like, you know, radio announcers like Monster Truck or something, they're going to really lean into that microphone and now they sound like Barry White because they've leaned in and it's really, really deep and bassy. Um, that's called the proximity effect. Um, so it's kind of what it sounds like. The closer in proximity you are to the microphone, the more that the low end of your voice or any, any kind of instrument um, is going to be amplified. You're going to get more low end. Um, ribbon mics are great for that because um, they are not as sensitive to the proximity effect as the, the like um, dynamic and condenser mics would be. Um, so that's something to think about too. Um, whatever you're micing or maybe for your voice yourself, if you're like, okay, well maybe I do wanna kind of get a little bit closer to it or I wanna make something very close um, or I have something that has a lot of low end to it, that's not going to add those low ends to it. Um, and the sound that produces from ribbon mics are usually really easy to EQ. Um, so then with the dynamic mics, um, so a ribbon mic is a type of dynamic mic. They usually, um, the distinction is usually made. So if someone's like, you know, oh, I'm going to use a dynamic mic, they usually don't mean ribbon. Um, if they want ribbon, they'll say ribbon. Um, and that's because a, a dynamic mic, so basically a dynamic mic means that they convert the signal by an electromagnetism. So what I was saying about the small metal ribbon hanging between those two magnets, that electromagnetism that's happening, that is how it's producing the sound. And that's how it's um, converting the sound to uh, from analog to digital. That's all it means when it's a dynamic mic is it's doing that. But the way this mic, which is actually the mic that I have here, um, this is one of my favorite mics, um, SM57. Um, this is made by Shure. Um, this is like hundred bucks. It's, it's a pretty good mic. Um, very, very sturdy and durable. This type of mic is made, it's called uh, moving coil. 
So what it has is that it has in here in this capsule, it has a metal coil, but the metal coil is attached to the rest of the microphone versus that ribbon that's just floating there. So the same process works. So I speak into it and that coil moves and the way that it moves, it will replicate that movement the way your ears would to go right into, to convert it into uh, digital back to analog. Um, but this just does it in a way that's much less delicate because the coil is bigger and it's attached versus just floating <laughs> between two magnets. There is still, still magnets in that happening in here, but not nearly as delicate and fragile as it is in the ribbon mic. Um, these are in particular great stage mics. Um, if you see someone who's on the road and they're performing, they are probably using a moving coil dynamic mic um, because these are, they're already powered so they don't require anything extra. A condenser mic like the Yetis, if you've ever been to our recording room at Central, you would notice that you have to press the phantom power button in order to get the microphone to work. Um, dynamic mics do not work that way. Um, in fact, if you use a dynamic mic on a ribbon mic, you can actually damage the ribbon um, because again, it's that fragile. Um, the moving coil dynamic mics, it won't do anything if you have the phantom power, but you just don't need it. Um, this is a uh, cardioid mic, which I'll talk about the pickup patterns on the next slide. Um, but that basically means that when I talk into it, it's picking up kind of in like a heart shape and cardioid um, all around here, but it's rejecting the back, which is why it's a great mic if I'm singing or performing on stage, because it'll pick me up as I'm singing and doing whatever, but it's not gonna pick up the audience. Um, and it even has, let me see if I can get it close. You can see that little kind of mushroom heart-shaped symbol. That means it's telling me right there on the microphone that it is a cardioid. Um, yeah, so really, really great microphones. Um, I had an audio engineering, uh, like live sound mentor who was telling me about this microphone, which is why I bought it. And he said, and I'm sure this is like an urban legend, but he said that he was one time on a tour as a roadie and there was a nail sticking out of the floor of this venue they were at. And he pointed it out to this guy who just, you know, been on, been a roadie for many, many decades. And he was like, oh, okay, picks this microphone off the microphone stand, flips it around, hammers the nail back in and then puts it back on the stand and it was fine. I wasn't there, I can't prove that was true, but I know that I have dropped this. I have moved with this and dropped a box and been like, oh, my microphones are in there and it's never had an issue. It's never even got a dent in it. So I don't know if you should use it for hardware, you know, putting up picture frames, but if you drop it, it would not be the end of the world. These are very, very sturdy microphones. Um, particularly this one, it's a really great guitar mic. Um, people also use it for vocals. Um, Tom Petty would sometimes use these when he was um, performing on the road. Again, durable great sound um, and kind of naturally set up to, to be able to handle life on the road. Um, so those are dynamic mics. And then lastly, here we have condenser mics. Um, and condenser mics, again, is this guy here. Um, and so a condenser needs phantom power. So it's um, what's called a passive mic. So it does not do anything until you power the uh so like just so look, with this it has a moving coil with the magnets so once i plug it into the xlr it's moving and going this needs a little power so it needs phantom power um which is also known as 48 volts um depending on your interface you will see either one it'll either say phantom power or it'll say 48 volts and that just means it's giving it 48 volts um of electricity um even if it just says phantom power that's what it's still doing which is why it can damage a ribbon mic because that's a kind of a lot of power to just immediately <laughs> give to um, a mic. Um, now this one is a USB. So um, it, to, to make it the simplest, because it's a USB one, it's plugging right into my computer. I do not need phantom power for this microphone. The ones that's central that are in the recording room that are XLR, yes, you do need to press that little phantom power button. Um, the ones here at Central um, are dynamic and they do not need to uh, have the phantom power. It will not damage them. You just don't need it. These are not ribbons. Um, these come in small or large diaphragm. This is the large diaphragm. You can see it's kind of big. Um, small diaphragm, uh, it will be shaped more like this. This is a dynamic mic, but this kind of pencil narrow shape. This is what small diaphragm ones are going to usually be more shaped like. Um, these ones are great because um, 
they have like a better frequency response. So um, they also will have less issues with the proximity effect. Um, they don't pick up like too much on the low end. Um, so they're really great for that. And that's also why they're really great podcasting mics. Um, Yeti in particular, um, or I'm sorry, Blue, um, this company in particular, they they do they even have like a whole podcasting set you can buy where it has like all the different equipment um because that's kind of what the benefit of condenser mics in is for uh recording podcasts um they're not going to add that extra bass to your voice that you would have to later like eq out um but the small diaphragm ones which i don't have one here to show you but a small diaphragm microphone they're going to be more consistent um i'm not sure exactly why that is but the pickup um, it's been proven and tested. The pickup for a large diaphragm is less consistent in frequency response. So, you know, how, how well it picks you up at different frequencies um, than the small diaphragm. The small diaphragms are pretty consistent across the board. Large diaphragms aren't as much. Um, but but I, I, I think either way, you would be fine. I would probably would recommend doing a small diaphragm for you recording your podcast. Um, that would be more if you were making like drums, because um, they have really great transient response. So transient response means like when you hit a drum, that like that hit, and then you know everything that follows, that like pat, and then that sound, you know, it's kind of like that after that attack, that release. That's called a transient. Its response to picking up those transients are much better on a small diaphragm. Um, I've definitely used. Um, I'm, I'm a big Shure person, so Shure SM31 or SM137s. Um, I've used those as overhead mics. So you mic them up on a boom and you have them just over a drum kit while they're playing. It's really, really great for that. Um, picks up really well, picks up all those drum hits. They're, they're awesome mics. Um, so all these mics will have ones that they're better for than others, especially for vocals um, and especially for podcasting, you can really go either way. You could really use any of these. Um, I've sung into this as well as use it to mic my guitar, and I feel like I've gotten uh, great results out of it both ways. This one, um, I felt like I get better um, for vocals than I do for um, guitars and things like that. Again, because it's, this is a large diaphragm, um, something like the heel that we have in here would definitely be better for, um, and it's a dynamic mic, this one would definitely be better for vocals. Um, but I've also used it on my guitar and um, and it can sound pretty nice, especially because your guitar is so loud. Um, so it kind of makes up for not having like a preamp to amplify that sound a little bit more. Um, so it's great. Um, ribbon mics, um, like I said, if you're recording a choir, maybe like for your church or you have a singing group, you have multiple singers, um, the ribbon mic will pick that up beautifully. Um, and then horns, woodwinds, harps. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to be recording their harp at home, but if you are, um, I think Ruben Mike would pick something up that like that beautifully. Um, I will say right now, I totally underestimated how much information we had to go through. Um, so we are pretty much at the end of our time here and we're almost not, not even really halfway through the, uh, the whole presentation. Um, I'm glad you guys had questions. Um, I love that that's great, um, being like engaged and active in the workshop. Um, I'm sorry we did not get through everything. Um, I will try to um, get through the other half of this, just talking more about the whole recording process um, in the following workshops, um, just to kind of give you an idea on what we did not cover. So just pick up patterns, which I kind of already alluded to when I was talking about the different microphones. So again, bi-directional is where it's picking up in these kind of, uh, the blue is where it's showing how it picks up. So cardioid is kind of my mic here. So it's rejecting the rear, which you can kind of think of the rear as here is the bottom of the microphone. Um, omni is where it's picking up all around. Bidirectional is where it's rejecting the sides, but picking up on both ends. So it's great for podcasting. Um, you know, you have one microphone, but you and another person are on either side of them. Um, it's going to pick you guys up both great while rejecting the sides. Um, hypercardioid and shotgun, um, those are just kind of, well, as you can see, there's just sort of like a little bit more of a, um, a or less of a rear rejection as you would get with uh, like cardioid. 
Um, and and they're great for again like singers. If you're like I don't really care if I you know don't, if I pick up a little bit of the rear, especially if you have a lot of people singing all around. Um, so those are kind of the different pickup patterns. For your purposes, you will probably only ever deal with cardioid, omni, and bidirectional. If you're doing a podcast, I would recommend really only doing bidirectional if you have a guest and you're on the same microphone, or cardioid if you're going to be on separate ones. Omni, you're going to get a lot of noise because it's picking up all around the microphone, which means it's picking up your whole room. So if you're not in a quiet room like here, like in the recording room, we have sound treatment where this room's pretty dead. Um, you know, like you're hearing me talk and you're not, like I said, hearing lots of sounds going on in the background. Um, if I had an Omni mic and I was recording like just up in like, you know, where all the books are and everything, it'd be really, really noisy versus uh, just recording with cardioid. So these are kind of the main three here, but these are two that you will see as options, especially on the Yetis. Um, and then we did not quite cover the recording process here. Um, and I can also send these slides to everyone who was on the email list as well. Um, it's okay that we didn't quite get through these slides here about microphone placement and everything, um, because we are going to go through these things as we go through each software. Um, so I kind of said this at the beginning, I'm introducing, or my goal was to introduce these topics in this workshop here. So as we go through the next five, when I say, you know, okay, about gain staging or checking levels, or you know, mixing, compression, EQ, these aren't brand new topics. Um, so I will just try to integrate these ideas and these concepts into the, um, the following workshops. And, and I had already planned to kind of you know, recap and say like, okay, remember what EQ was. Um, we just won't have as much time to talk about it as in depth as uh, I would have liked to this time around. Um, uh, so if, yeah, if anyone would like the slides, um, feel free to respond to the email that I sent um, with a meeting invite, um, and that goes for every week. Um, and I'd be more than happy to uh, send those um, slides over. Um, so if, yeah, if you would like to read over them to kind of get an idea of, um, of what we didn't cover and what we'll kind of like talk about in the following weeks, these concepts. Um, and if you have any questions, um, absolutely email or call or come in and see us. Um, but yeah, the remaining ones were just about recording and mixing. And then lastly, the software overview. Um, so if you want to kind of get it, kind of get an idea of these different um, software, if you've never used them before, um, and you kind of see where you're like, oh, you know, I might not even need Pro Tools. Maybe I can just do Audacity. Um, and we have like three minutes. <laughs> so the last thing that I will leave and I'll, um, show and just briefly go over and again I'll send all these slides is this chart I made here um this will be something that you will probably really want to look at especially when I send you the slides where you kind of refer back to it about the different digital audio workstations these are just the five that we're going to cover because th these are the five that we have here at uh, Central and Bar I didn't want to introduce anything that you can come here and use free with your library card so this is by no means exhaustive um, but uh, but these are the five that we'll cover, and this is the order that we will be covering them in the following workshops. Um, so this is showing you here that only two out of the five that we're going to cover do not deal with MIDI. So that will be the two that we do next week and the week after. We'll have no MIDI, so we will not be talking about MIDI in those next two um, next two weeks because those software they do not cover it. Um, two of them, Adobe Audition and Pro Tools, do have video capability. So if you, um, you're making a score for a short film that you're doing or a you know, music video, um, you will have the ability to sort of kind of have your audio and your video in both Adobe Audition and Pro Tools. Um, beginner friendly, so ones where like, you know, I remember when I first got started, the ones that seemed the least daunting to me were definitely Audacity and FL Studio. Um, both of them have very, very simple layouts. Um, they can do a lot. They're by no means simple um, or not powerful or not quality. They just have, they're not trying to reinvent the wheel the way a lot of other software can, um, where they, you know, they want to use different terms for the same topics or something like that. Um, so very friendly. Uh, and then 
cost wise. So um, most of these, uh, except for I think Adobe, have a free trial version. So when I say free here for these two, that's kind of what that means. Um, Audacity is always free. So Audacity is a great one. Audacity is always free. Um, the, the other four do have a cost. And as you can see, they can get very expensive. Um, for all of these, beyond Audacity, which is obviously free, um, we have sort of the medium option here um, at Creative Experience. So we don't have the like super producer, very, very expensive pack, but we have just right in the middle where you kind of get all the options that you want, but maybe a little bit, you know, less for all the um, sort of like bells and whistles, but um, by no means like a lesser version, just less cost <laughs> version. Um, so if you do come here and use it and you want to know which version that we have, so you can get that one, we'll be more than happy to, to help you do that. Or again, you can always use them here for 100% free with your library card. Um, if anyone has uh, any other questions, um, we right at seven, <laughs> right on the <laughs> right on the dot. Um, but yeah, I can stick around if anyone has any questions. Um, and again, we'll do a brief recap and we'll definitely go through um, those two different um, uh, two different sections of the the slides here that I didn't get to cover. Um, and I will send these work the this out to um, anyone who would like it, um, who is on the, yeah, the list for tonight. And um, if you don't have any questions, thank you so much for coming. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next week.